Hank Skinner was sentenced to death in 1995 for a gruesome triple murder of his 41-year-old girlfriend Twyla Busby and her two mentally disabled sons, 20-year-old Randy Busby and 22-year-old Elwin Kaler on New Year's Eve in Pampa in 1993. Skinner did not deny having been in the house where the three died, but said he had passed out from a combination of drugs and liquor. He was found in a nearby house with blood on his clothing, but he insisted that DNA testing would prove his innocence. Skinner avoided a total of five execution dates, in one case missing the executioner's needle by a few minutes. On March 24, 2010, 20 minutes before his second scheduled execution the U.S. Supreme Court issued a stay of execution to consider the question of whether Skinner could request testing of DNA his attorney chose not to have tested at his original trial in 1994. On death row, conversations with Hank Skinner, Skinner shared a gripping account with Werner Herzog about his incredibly close brush with death just minutes before the scheduled lethal injection. Skinner vividly described the surreal mix of relief and disbelief that washed over him, knowing that he had narrowly escaped his imminent demise. It was a dramatic twist in his ongoing quest to prove his innocence, bringing a glimmer of hope to a case shrouded in uncertainty. I was within 20 minutes of execution. I had had my last visits. I, they took me over there to the walls. I was in the death house. So. I had had, you know, I have a, I have a priest who supports me that's from the yeah. Vatican, and he came over here and delivered the last rites. He brought an apostolic blessing from the Pope. Um, they anointed me with oil on my hands and my head, so I had went, you know, I had had uh, extreme unction, the last rites, confirmation, communion. Um, I went through the whole thing. The only thing, the only thing was they didn't kill me. I ate, I ate my last meal. And your holding cell is only five, six steps away from the gurney. Yes. It's just a barred front cell. As I yes. was sitting there eating and talking on the phone, I could look to my left and I could see the doorway. I could see the gurney. I could see the arm boards. I could see the microphone hanging down and I could see the windows where the witnesses watched through there. So I was li literally looking at my death while I was sitting there eating. I wasn't bothered by it at all. You were not afraid? No. I wasn't scared in the sense of dying and I'm not going to exist anymore, okay? I was scared of the blackness, the unknown, you know what I mean? You get closer and closer and closer and they're going to kill you, they're going to kill you, they're going to kill you. Because this ain't something you do every day. You don't go over there and lay down and die every day, you know? When you did this trip, you are being transported from yes. Lunsky unit uh, about 48, 50 miles to 41. the death house. For, yes, The walls unit. 41 miles, yes. Do the guards shout out dead men walking or no. things like that? No, they no. don't. No. That's movies. Yes. No, they never do that. The, the people who handle you when, you, when they come to pick you up at this unit, there's a major, a captain, a lieutenant, and a sergeant. Four people in the van with you, okay? The driver, the front seat passenger, the jump seat driver that's in front of the dog cage. There's a dog cage inside the van, and that's what you're locked in. It's made out of this stuff right here. And so it's like this. And there's one guy sitting in front of it. There's one guy sitting behind it between the cage and the back doors. They're very stern and sincere about what they want you to do. They have a protocol. They do this once a week, so they're very good at it, you know. They're the, they're the team who handles this, okay. They're the death house team. That's all they do. And they get paid extra pay for it, okay. They're required to tell you that we need to tell you too that if anyone tries to stop, there's a caravan, there's a car in front and there's two chase cars behind, they're all armed to the teeth, okay? And they tell you right off the bat, hey, look, if anybody tries to stop this van and tries to get you out of here, we will kill you first. And they got guns. I mean, in the, the guy in the jump seat, this one back here has got a shotgun, this one in the front's got a pistol and an AR-15, high tech weaponry, you know, and they tell you we will shoot you first, so you need to know that. When they get you over there, you've got from one o'clock to six o'clock, five hours, but it goes just like that. Time is flying so fast, at five o'clock they take the phone away from you, okay? 
and from four o'clock to six o'clock, you're eating your last meal. They start serving it to you at four o'clock. They just hand it, you have to pull your mattress back and hand it to you in the bowls. Okay, so I'm sitting there eating, I'm talking on the phone, and the chaplain tells me, you're gonna have to hang the phone up. I, I, I can't let you go any further, you know. He said, you done went 15 minutes, 13 minutes after, so. I said, well, I tell you what, I said, I wanna make one more call. He said, who do you wanna call? I said, I wanna call my lawyer. And he says, okay, he said, I'll let you call your lawyer. So he dialed the number and the lawyer answers, Hank? And I said, yeah. He said, it's Doug Robinson, my lead counsel. And he says, Hank? I said, yeah. He said, man, you have the most uncanny sense of timing of any man I have ever met in my life. I said, why do you say that? He said, no sooner had I heard the click, the Supreme Court clerk just hung up the phone, than you came on the line. He said, I didn't even hear the phone ring. And he said, they granted you a stay. And when he said that, I couldn't hear anything. Tears started running down my eyes, and I, my legs give out, and I slid down the wall, and my ears were buzzing. I felt like somebody had lifted a thousand pound weight off of my chest. And I didn't realize that I felt like that until after this happened, you know? So it was scary, you know what I mean? And so I thought, well, why am I so upset now? I should have been upset that they was gonna kill me. But I was handling that, you know what I'm saying? But this news now I've gotta stay. And so I still had some of my food left sitting up there on the bunk. And so I got to looking at that food and suddenly I was ravenous. I, wanted, I was eating it before, but I was eating it kind of slow. But now I wanted to just devour it all. And so I got up and I grabbed the food and I started eating it. And I was just, I was so elated and so happy that I, the, the chaplain told me, he said, you look like God had touched you. He said, you were just beatific. He said, you were just beaming and smiling. Your eyes were all, you know. And then the lieutenant comes in there and tells me, he says, uh, your lawyer told you that you got to stay? I said, yeah. He said, listen, I need to tell you something. And I said, what? He said, you see them two phones over there on that wall? I said, yes, sir. He said, that's the governor's line and the attorney general's line. Unless one of those phones ring and tell us to stand down, this execution is going forward at six o'clock because we do not accept stays from defense counsel. And how long did it take until the that, phone rang? That was the longest 23 minutes of my life. It was 5.13. The phone did not ring until 20 minutes till six o'clock that they got the official order to stand down. And the phone rung, the lieutenant went over there and picked it up real smartly and got on the phone and said, hello. And he said, and you're sure? And they said, yeah. And he said, and we're to stand down. And they said, that's right. There's no execution tonight. He said, we thank you very much. Hung the phone up. He said, Skinner, you got to stay. Well, anyway, so I told him, I said, man, my heart's beating pretty hard. I have, I'm, I got high blood pressure. I take medicine for us. I haven't had my medication this, this evening. And he said, why didn't you take it? I said, well, hell, they were going to kill me. What's the point of taking some medicine? What's that going to do, you know? He's like, yeah, I see your point. He said, well, I'll get the nurse down here to, to see you. And he said, well, give me them plates back. I said, no, I'm going to finish eating this meal. You just go get the nurse. And so the chaplain tells me, he said, you know, Skinner, he said, you really blow my mind. I said, why? He said, most of the guys, when they had two weeks out and they want to get the meal, he said, they, they got big eyes. They want everything. And he said, but when it, when it gets down to the nitty gritty, like today, you almost died. He said, they can't eat nothing. He said, they sit here and talk on the phone and they cry with their family. And he said, then it's time to go. And he said, the meal is virtually untouched. And he said, the, the prisoners in the ODR, which is the officer's dining room, are the ones who prepare these meals. And he said, they do the best they can for two reasons. One reason is they know it'll be the last thing you ever eat on this earth. And so they want it to be as good as they can make it for you. And he said, the second thing is they know you're going to be so damn nervous you can't eat it anyway. And when it comes back to them, they're going to get it and they're going to eat it, right? <laughs> and he said, so they're going to be sorely disappointed today. <laughs> so, you know what was the saddest part of after I got to stay? And so he said, but we're, we're going to take you back to the Polanski unit. And that's when it dawned on me, you know what I'm saying? The only thing that I've won right now is they're going to take me back over there to that hell hole I just came from. Where we are sitting right now. Yes. You see, this looks pretty nice out here, you know what I mean? It's a whole different story back there. You, you don't see yeah, the... Death row, we yeah. cannot see, yes. We yes. are not allowed. Yes. And I want to say this. It, they do not treat us mean or they do not mistreat us. That's got nothing to do with what it is. What it is, is all these guys, the oppression, all these guys sentenced to death, all these guys that are suffering this with me, okay? And so that's what makes it so bad. It is a place of human bondage and human suffrage. And, you know, it's like in the nighttime, guys, you hear them crying, you hear them caught because they're suffering. You know, it's, 
I'm not sure how to explain it. It's, a, it's just a bad place. You know what I mean? It's a bad place. They kill somebody here about once a week. When you did this trip and you knew you were going to Wall's unit, to the death house, could you see the landscape out there? When we got to the end of the driveway, I was so happy to be leaving this place. I hate this place. I despise this place. It was almost like seeing something alien. I'm um, saying if someone took you to like say Israel and set you down in the middle of the Holy Land, it was the very first time you'd ever saw it. You know, it, you'd be in shock, in awe. You know what I mean? So when you see stuff like that and you know that you're going to die, you know, the whole thing. I was, at certain points over there, I was just laughing insanely to myself because it's like, this can't be real. <laughs> There's no way in hell this, this is really happening. I'm having a bad dream and I'm going to wake up in a minute and somebody's going to tell me, you know, what's wrong with you, man? You're talking in your sleep again, you know? But at the same time, being so sad from losing everything earthly and dying, you know, I believe in the hereafter. It's like going on a trip. You're going to see something for the first time. And then there's the unknown, you know, and you just vacillate between these three emotions. It just keeps getting, you know, it's like, well, what's going to happen next when I get on the other side? You know, I'll, I'll be free of this flesh. I'll be out of this flesh. I can do, I can go however I want and do whatever I want to do, but will I still be, you know, am I just going to be spread out some Maybe not nothing conscious, or what is it going to be, you know? And so you think about that, then you think about the unknown form, you know? It's permanent. Whatever happens, you're stuck with it. You can't come back. In a legal clash where truth hangs in the balance, Skinner's defense team asserted that the results of DNA testing would have significantly bolstered his chances of acquittal had the jury been exposed to this pivotal evidence. They contended that it was reasonably probable for him to be cleared of the slayings if these revelations had been unveiled in court. However, standing firm on their ground, prosecutors countered by asserting that the majority of the DNA evidence pointed an accusing finger directly at Skinner. Skinner and his attorneys had pointed to Twyla Busby's now-deceased uncle, Robert Donnell, as the possible killer. Following his death, Skinner's attorneys stated, Mr. Skinner was still challenging his conviction at the time of his death, and we are deeply sorry that he passed away before those proceedings were complete.